So um, I'm very excited to be hosting tonight's event, but before we begin, uh, this event is being held in partnership with Comma DC, and I'm gonna welcome uh, one of the volunteers from Comma DC, Pam Goob, up to say a few words about her organization, and then I will return. Hi, everyone. Um, as I mentioned, I'm a, my name is Kim, and I'm a volunteer with Comma DC. Have you anybody heard of Comma DC? Okay, at least one. Yay! Good. Well, we are so proud to be here to partner with Politics and Prose and help support Angie's uh, new book release. And for those that don't know, Comma DC is an all-volunteer-run nonprofit organization that supports elevating the voices of immigrants and refugees in the DMV area. And we mostly do that through um, storytelling events, immigrant-led classes. We have a podcast called Journeys um, and film events. So just to share a couple of highlights, we have an upcoming uh, storytelling event in partnership with the Nigerian Center in Anacostia on October 10th. And it's going to be around the theme of independence and individuality um, a few days after Nigeria's Independence Day. And really talking about how um, folks have uh, immigrated and how they found themselves. So if you're interested in learning more, please uh, visit us at commadc.org, K-A-M-A-D-C.org, and follow us on social media. We invite you to learn more, get involved, especially if you want to volunteer or attend or even uh, perform at one of our events. So with that, I would just like to say thank you again to Politics and Prose and this opportunity to partner and um, support immigrant authors. Thank you. Thank you, Kim and Kama DC for helping support this event. And I'm very excited to be hosting tonight's event featuring two of my friends who happen to be among my favorite writers as well. Uh, a few words about Angie Kim's new book, Happiness Falls. I will keep it brief. Uh, all I really need to tell you is it's fantastic. Riveting is the word that keeps appearing in blurbs and reviews for good reason. It's a page turner that's also very smart and thoughtful, and it introduces ideas about communication and neurodiversity that will likely change the way you think about language. The book's getting all sorts of deserved accolades and was an instant New York Times bestseller, as well as a book of the month club pick, an Indie Next pick, uh, so many other picks, I'm not gonna list them all. Um, ditto for the great reviews, but I'll just reference the Washington Post review, which called it a deliciously brainy new thriller. Angie's also the author of Miracle Creek, which won several awards, including the Edgar, and was named one of the best books of the year by Time, the Washington Post, Kirkus, and the Today Show. Angie moved as a preteen from Seoul, South Korea to Baltimore. Before she turned to novel writing, she worked as an attorney after attending Harvard Law School, where she was an editor of the Law Review, so total slacker. Um, she will be in conversation with the equally amazing Lou Byard, who, in the words of the New York Times, reinvigorates historical fiction. He's written many novels, including The Pale Blue Eye, which was recently adapted into a Netflix release starring Christian Vale. Bale, excuse me. His most recent novel is Jackie and Me, which we have for sale, so please pick up a copy. He also teaches at George Washington, and he wrote the popular Daunton Abbey recaps for the New York Times. So please help me welcome Angie and Lou. Okay. All right. So this. hi, hi everyone. We clearly got the memo about our uh, colors. I we, know, we, we, right? We, yeah, we clearly got the memo. I um, know. We match. We do match. So that was excited. that. Was, that's that shows what what good friends we are. We didn't. We even, are. We didn't. We didn't even, even talk about no, it. No, we didn't. We didn't. We just match. So, um, <laughs> Angie and I go back how many years now? Four? I don't know. Like five, five, six, five, six? five. No, Christina's Christina. saying five. We yeah. were part right, of a, six, six. She's saying six. We were part of an authors group that yeah. met uh, at Union Station every couple of months, two or three months. 
And this was just before, this is before your, your first book yeah, even come out. Absolutely. I've got to ask you, because did you think then that you would be at the level you are now? Well, Good Morning America and New York Times bestseller list. And is that, is, was that the vision you had or was it just kind of like... No, I no. didn't have any vision. And in fact, back then, so um, Happiness Falls, my book, has a lot to do with happiness theories. The, it's, it's in a nutshell, like the elevator pitch is that it's about a family in crisis. And it starts with when the father of this biracial Korean American family goes missing. And the only person who might know what happened to him is 14 year old Eugene, the baby of the family, who um, by virtue of having this rare genetic disorder called Angelman syndrome cannot speak. And so we don't know what happened to the father. And in order to figure out what happened to the father, the family has to really come together and try to communicate with each other and, you know, really connect. And, um, and so, you know, that's sort of the premise of it, but the missing father has this thread throughout the novel where he is just kind of obsessed with happiness theories and he is trying to quantify happiness. He's trying to maximize it for himself, for his children and his family. And one of the things that he talks about is how happiness is really your experience level divided by your expectations. And so it's the happiness quotient. And yeah. so that's what I sort of thought for the longest time. And so actually, when I was going through the whole Miracle Creek experience, I was actually trying to keep my expectations very low and like thinking like nothing's going to happen with this book. I'm going to get awful reviews. People are going to hate it and all of that sort of stuff, which is actually, I guess, good when, you know, like you actually do get good reviews because then you're pleasantly surprised and you're like, yay, this is great. I'm happy now. But while you're going through the ramp up part kind of sucks. <laughs> and so, you know, so during that part, it was, I, I don't think I like really allowed myself to think any of those things. Now, on the other hand, the father comes to think towards the end of the book, like, actually, that's not really true because of this phenomenon that if you have low expectations, you might be happier later, but you're not going to be, you're going to have a sh pretty shitty today, you know? And so he actually comes to realize that what you need to do is divide your experience, not by your expectations, but by your baseline. And so... That's what I kind of tried to do with Happiness Falls. Like I tried to have really, really high expectations and have those silly dreams and fantasies and, you know, which bring a smile to your face and make you happy for a little bit. And but at the same time, really try to remember the baseline of myself as a writer, which is when you start that story and you have no idea if you're going to actually be able to finish it, let alone get an agent you know, be able to sell it, have a book deal and actually have a finished book product. I have to say my father had the same attitude. The, the, the more you dread it, the better, better off the outcome will be. Yeah. Right. Um, it seems strange to me to uh, even quantify, try to quantify or create a quotient for happiness. Cause I experience it as grace that just sort of falls from the skies and, and I'm, I'm happy when it, when it comes and, and, and sad to see it go. Um, but I, I love the idea of trying to pin that down and, and yeah. create a discipline around happiness. And that's what the father is trying to do, which is, is sort of touching and poignant. It's of. touching and poignant, but also he's mm -hmm. also doing like, you know, experiments involving his children. Yeah. Yeah. So that's very not Skinner that box. Great. Skinner box. Yeah. Stuff. yeah. So yeah. that's not the best. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, just to, so we can situate people, do you want to just read the first paragraph of the book? So, yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah, great, Absolutely. It has one of, the, one, of, one of the better opening lines you'll read. Um, so this. it is um, narrated by, the whole thing is narrated by the 20-year-old daughter, Mia, in first person. And um, I'll read from part one, everyone's fine. And spoiler alert, everyone is not fine. <laughs> um, chapter one is Lock, Bach and K-pop. We didn't call the police right away. Later, I would blame myself. 
Wonder if things might have turned out differently if I hadn't shrugged it off. Insisting dad wasn't missing missing, but just delayed. Probably still in the woods looking for Eugene, thinking he'd run off somewhere. Mom says it wasn't my fault, that I was merely being optimistic, but I know better. I don't believe in optimism. I believe there's a fine line, if any, between optimism and willful idiocy. So I try to avoid optimism altogether, lest I fall over the line mistakenly. <laughs> so we have a mystery in that very first line. Where is, where's dad? Yeah. Where is dad? One of the things that fascinates me about the book um, is that I, I feel like you are deliberately denying us the resolution that we as consumers of TV procedurals want. We want to know the answers. Yeah. We want to know where dad is. We want to know what happened. We don't, and, and I feel like you are deliberately saying no. Yeah. Yeah. No, I'm so glad that you said that. So, you know, obviously there is a missing person mystery, you know, because the father is missing. Um, but I feel like what I want to do with this story, and I did the same thing, I think, with my first book, Miracle Creek, um, which is the mystery at the core of the novel, the through line, is really a Trojan horse. It's a device to pull readers in and to get you interested and get you, you know, turning the pages because hopefully you do want to know. I, I wanted to know what happened to the father when I was writing. I had no idea what happened to the father. And that's what got me into my writing chair in my little writing closet, a little closet where I write. And, you know, and I wanted to do that because I needed to, I, I figured, you know, I need to know what happened to the father in order to know I need to write it. And so it is something that's there, but that's not my, my real interest is in exploring what happens to the family as a result of that. It's less in trying to figure out what happened to the father and more in what is the effect on the people that this has left behind. And I feel like a lot of mysteries um, w most of which focus on missing women and girls rather than men, um, really do focus on sort of what happened. And, and I guess for me, it is more about exploring, let's try to figure out what happens when a person goes missing. But because, uh, and so the characters talk about this in the book, how a missing person mystery is like the most frustrating for in real life, because unlike other crimes like homicide or, you know, um, kidnapping or whatever, you don't know what happened. The, the vast amount of what you don't know in a missing person mystery is the most like maximal thing that you don't know. So it could be that they have been tortured and killed and murdered. Or it could be that they decided to like run away with, you know, somebody that they're having an affair with and they're off in like Fiji somewhere, you know, and they just decided not to tell the family about it or they forgot or they wrote a note and the dog ate it, which did happen in an actual mystery, very popular book that I read. And I was so mad at the end of it that I like threw it um, across, uh, uh, across my room. And so it's one of these things where what you don't know is so vast. And I wanted to explore what that does to the psyche, what that does to the people who are left behind. So walking it back, you write in a closet. Let's go there. Let's go. What, <laughs> yes. what is this closet? What does this look like? Are you, are you there voluntarily? What is, I what am is, there what, voluntarily. What is I love my closet. It's like a little <laughs> cocoon. Um, so I live in this humongous house and all of our kids are gone. We have three boys and all three are gone now. So we have an empty nest now. And yet I still like, I, I come back to this little closet. So I have like seriously three boys bedrooms that are empty with desks that I could use with nice views and everything. And yet I go to this tiny little closet. It's about the size of this desk. I don't even think it's as big as this desk. Um, 
and I go in and it's got like the sloped ceiling. So I can't, you look so pained. I'm, I'm so pained. The claustrophobia <laughs> is, is, is intense. No, I yeah. mean, the door is open. It's not like I'm locked in. I'm, if I were locked in, I think I would probably die. It's, uh, it's very small. And, um, and so I sit on the floor and what I love about it is that there's no window or anything. So I have this huge um, like TV screen type thing. And so I have this like video of, you know, the beach, like the ocean running throughout in the back. So it makes me feel like I'm at the I'm at the beach and um, Christina, who's sitting back there, um, she is part, part, of, my, part of our, our lunch group. Yes. yes and yes. she is in, um, my writing, um, she's one of my writing partners and we do a lot of writing together. And sometimes we go away to her mom's beautiful beach place and we write at the beach and I love that it inspires me so much. And since I can't have that where I am in my house, I try to recreate it in my little closet, you know? One thing else you said was you you didn't know the you didn't know how it turned out no. when you started writing. Mm -mm. How much of this, your story do you know before you start writing? John Irving says he knows everything that's going to happen. I know that's so annoying. It's so annoying. I feel like it's so annoying. Yeah, no, it's really I I don't like John Irving. No, at all. I don't. Yeah, no, no, absolutely not. He also says like he thinks about it for like a year and he's able to write it in like a week or something. It really pisses me off. Why would you want, write it if you already know what's going to happen? Well, right exactly. <laughs> so that's the thing. That's the thing. I don't I feel like I write to find out what I think about something that I don't know what I think about. Like that something that puzzles me and something that drives me crazy and something that I'm just like, I don't understand why things are the way they are. And so that's what I do. And so. Um, when I started writing Mural Creek, there's a an ex, it's a mystery with an explosion that happens in the beginning. I didn't know who set the fire. I didn't know why or how it happened. And that was like a good way for me to sort of get my butt into my writing chair and, you know, and actually get some writing done. And same thing here. I didn't know what happened to the father. This is a family I dearly love. I have been writing about this family for like 13 years now through a short stories and- Talk about the short story. Yeah, so the short story, so I started writing in my 40s. And um, one of the first short stories I ever wrote was about this family and written in the voice of Mia, the same um, uh, narrator. And um, except that Mia in the short story was like 14 years old and this family was in Seoul, South Korea. And it was about these twins, Mia and John, who are fraternal twins who felt really guilty because they did something in this cemetery, this Korean graveyard, when their mom was pregnant with their baby brother, Eugene. And they felt like they caused him to be non-speaking. So he is autistic in the short story and has um, and can't can't speak. And they feel like they caused his voice to seep out literally into the ground. And so they are throughout the short story, it's a magical realism story. They're using this weird kind of haunted stethoscope that they find. Um, and using that to try to literally find his voice somewhere in the ground, like using the stethoscope, sort of like a doctor uses it, you know, to listen to, you know, something that's going on inside your body. And um, this family has just stayed with me ever since then. So it was uh, published in 2013. And so that was 10 years ago. And even when I was writing other short stories or Miracle Creek, I just sort of thought, I wonder what's happening with this family. So when my own kids were like applying to colleges, for example, I would be thinking like, I wonder where Mia and John are applying to colleges. I bet Mia is getting into a lot more colleges than John is. And I wonder if that's causing a rift between them, you know, like I wonder what their essays are about. And um, and then when I found out about 
some therapies that um, I know some dear friends of mine for their children who are non-speakers that they went through um, in order to teach their children how to communicate by using these spelling boards that are sort of like held in front of you and the kids learn to spell by pointing to letters one by one in a very painstaking process and it takes years for them to learn how to do that but they did learn how to do it and when i found out about that i thought you know what i wonder if this family tried that for eugene and I wonder what they thought because it's so painful. It's so joyful when you find out that somebody you assumed all their lives weren't there, didn't have words, were called nonverbal, meaning without words, um, and had significant cognitive challenges. When you find out that they have been there and it's just been a motor issue, an oral motor issue why they couldn't talk, I think it's so joyful to realize that they're there, but at the same time, so painful yeah. that they had been there all yeah. along. And somebody you yeah. love so much, your own child has been there like that. And it's so I sort of thought, you know, I wonder what this family would go through. And that was the kernel of the story. I'm reminded of uh, we talked about awakenings. We talked about my left foot. This idea that there's a soul that's trapped inside a body that won't let it out, you know, and and then yeah. and the pain and the poignancy of knowing that it's been there this whole time and you weren't able to hear it. Yeah. Eugene is such a, a poignant character, but also not a sentimental character. He is. He's got edges. He's got. Yeah. Absolutely. He's 14. He's a 14 year old boy, which we've both been through. Yeah. <laughs> and so he definitely has edges. But I think we assume of people who are non speaking and whom we call disabled, that we we assume that they're innocent and like angelic. Um, and in fact, you know, Eugene does have something, it's actually a real term that's called the Angelman syndrome, uh, where the people who have the syndrome actually are characterized by having persistent smiling and a lot of laughing. So you think that they're joyful and happy all the time. And, you know, you have to sort of like go beneath that to sort of ask, is that really true, what we're assuming? Are they really happy? And also, like, does that mean that they are all innocent and, you know, angelic and not capable of any wrongdoing? An angels in the name. Right, right? exactly. Yeah, yeah. Although it's funny because it's actually because the doctor who discovered the syndrome was named Angelman, yeah. Angelman yeah. not yeah. Dr. Angelman, not yeah. because of the angel. Um, but you also have these, these, it's a very richly portrayed family and you have, um, the, the twins, you have John and Mia, yeah. uh, um, Mia of course is our narrator. She is, yeah. she's our way in. Um, how did you find her voice? So again, I think it's from this short story that I wrote, um, and that voice just stayed with me. So Mia, for those of you who haven't read, she is, she's such a character. She's, she's 20 years old. She thinks she, she she's knows. A, she's a pistol. She's, right, yeah. right. Like, and she is, she is like, so for those of you who don't, who haven't had 20 year old children lately, she thinks she knows everything <laughs> and she can be so annoying and it is unbelievable. And she's so strong and she's so stubborn and you almost want to like throttle her sometimes. Like sometimes I just want to bonk her over the head and be like, you don't know everything. Just let it go. Um, and she can be very annoying and she knows that about herself and she's very smart and she's so curious. And what's wonderful about her is that, um, I, I write in this method that I, I call the, um, the method writing because of my theater background when I did a lot of method acting. So I really try to inhabit the heads of, you know, the characters that I'm writing from, whose POVs I'm writing from. And whenever I'm writing from her head, I, I became 
so completely curious about the world, about everything. And so I found myself just like going down these rabbit holes and like researching things. And it was really fun. And she can be very cynical and very dry, right? So she can be kind of funny. And so I would like find myself writing. Oh, bratty. Right. Oh, definitely (laughs) bratty, right? Um, But like so, but so endearing in a way that I knew that so much of what she was feeling was out of regret and um i mean even the first line uh we didn't call the police right away yes there's a lot of questions in that hopefully it does pull you in but more than anything i hope that it tells you that how much guilt she's feeling she has so much regret about what she did and didn't do when her father went missing and her role in all the things that happened throughout the story that she just feels so badly about. And so I really feel like it's that regret that carries her more than anything else. I feel I've, I bled for everyone in this family because I was thinking as, as bad as my kids worst days are, that is kind of their everyday. They're dealing with a, a, a child who has extreme needs and, and needs extreme amounts of care. And then, which means that the other two kids, the twins, that don't, basically don't get parented at, yeah. at some level. Yeah. And I, I, I just, I felt bad for all of them. And I, did, I think yeah. you did a great job of not making anybody the villain or the hero yeah. of, this, of this piece. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, and, and I think that was my goal for people who have read Miracle Creek. I feel like this is kind of a companion piece to that. It's kind of the flip side of the coin because you know, uh, Miracle Creek really talked about sort of the extreme parenting sacrifices and sort of looking at outsiders, um, whether they be linguistic and cultural ethnic outsiders like immigrants or medical outsiders as families of, you know, children with special needs. And, um, but looking at it from the extreme parenting sacrifices that are really required. And here it was really thinking about it from the sibling's perspective and from the child himself, like the actual child who is, you know, who has these challenges and what is that like, you know? Yeah, yeah. A um, couple of things I noticed. One is um, it's set during COVID. It's mm. COVID is very much a, a presence in this story yeah. in an interesting way. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. So I, it's funny because I didn't mean for it to be a presence in the story. And um, it's just that when I started writing, when I started drafting, so I've been, you know, thinking about these characters forever and doing a lot of free writing. But when I started drafting, like what is the first line going to be? What is the first chapter going to be? That was June of 2020, which is when the book starts. And I found myself just not being able to write. I was having so much trouble. And I think partly it was because I couldn't figure out what life was like. Like it seemed so different. And so when I was trying to write it from, you know, without the presence of COVID, without, you know, the pandemic and the quarantine and the masks and all that, I was just like, I don't even remember what that life was like. And also, it didn't seem all that important just because we were so cons- I was so consumed by it. And so when I started thinking about this family that's dealing with the pandemic and going on a hike nearby in a nearby park where they were having to deal with a kid who had sensory issues, who's having trouble keeping his mask on, all of a sudden it just came alive for me. And I thought, you know what, I'll just go ahead and write it from this perspective. And my editor um, actually bought this on the first 60 pages in like December of 2020. And I remember telling him and my agent, like, it's okay. We, I know that we don't understand what's going to happen with the pandemic and pandemic stories and blah, 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 and marketing. And what I will do is we can just take that out. That's okay. Like we can easily take all that out. Um, And I really believe that. And I still believe that. I think that if they had said like, listen, we really need to not have the pandemic in this, I could have taken it out. But 
by the time I was done with it, um, it really did seem like so many of the things that we went through as a society and having the society's baseline be completely different. You know, that was a theme that we were exploring that the dad especially was exploring with respect to, you know, the baseline of the happiness. And also like the fact that everybody was wearing masks and um, Mia talks about the fact that Eugene's smile, his persistent smile is a mask that he himself is kind of always wearing. And so by virtue of having the COVID mask that was masking that mask, like, you know, they were actually able to figure out much more clearly what he was actually feeling. And so things like that made me feel like, okay, well, this is something that we can actually, you know, leave in. And luckily my, my team, my editor agreed. Yeah. One of, one of the characters actually comes down with COVID at a critical moment in the, yeah. in the story. So there's, yeah. there's that too. But I'm also struck by being a, a Northern Virginia boy myself. Yeah. Virginia, Northern Virginia, just yeah. like with your last book very much a part of it. I mean, how much are you concerned with getting specific locations or is, is it more of a, just a gen, more general idea? Of it's more, I think it's more the general idea. I mean, I, I, so the park where the family like lives right by, it's very much informed by my own, you know, hikes and things like that such as they are because I'm not really a hiker, um, in great falls park. Um, and, but, I, I changed some things of it. So like there are falls that are like really high, which really there aren't in, you know, Great Falls Park. And so I didn't want people coming back to me and being like, you know, I know Great Falls Park and there is no such trail yeah. that does this and this and that. It's never named, right? Yeah, the park exactly. Is so no, it is. It's, I think I call it River Falls Park okay, or something right. like that. So I gave it like a slightly different name so that it's fictionalized, but you can sort of tell, especially if you know the area that clearly I meant like Great Falls Park, you know? So Great Falls won't be suing you for, for no. mis mis <laughs> Let's hope misrepresentation. Not. <laughs> no, no. Misrepresentation. Um, another thing that's clearly autobiographical is the is the Korean element. Yeah. In Miracle Creek, you, you you have a character who, much like you, uh, was a teenager and who came, yeah. coming to America. Yeah. And this here you kind of interesting move it in the other direction. So yeah. the twins actually go from being Americans to being Koreans yeah. who can't speak the language. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And although the mom is a Korean yes, immigrant Hannah. who yeah. Hannah, who came over here and she has a, she got her linguistics PhD here, but she didn't come over to the U S until she was like 18. So she definitely has, you know, both of them, both, uh, Mia and Hannah understand each other's perspective, but from sort of the other perspective, you know, Mia going from here to Korea and vice versa. But the interesting thing about Mia and John is that John presents as white and Mia presents as Asian. So even though they're both mixed and so they get treated differently in both countries. And so that's really interesting because when by virtue of John presenting as white, he doesn't face some of the discrimination and bias that Mia faces. And gender yeah. enters into it as well. Oh, of yeah. course. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. No, totally. And, you know, and the other thing that I wanted to sort of bring up by virtue of that experience is that the family does, by virtue of that experience, have a little bit of a basis for understanding what it's like to be Eugene. So... You know, I am a Korean immigrant. I came over from Korea to the U.S. when I was 11 in middle school when, you know, it's such a hard time anyway. Yeah. Like middle school is just sucks. And um, so I went overnight from feeling like a pretty smart girl who, you know, had lots of friends and I was outgoing and I could speak fluently to the next day coming over and then all of a sudden not being able to speak the language. And when that happens, I didn't realize until I went through that how much our society values oral fluency, how much we equate oral fluency with, with intelligence. intelligence. Yeah. And so all of a sudden I felt not just frustrated by the language blocks, but just shame 
you know, the shame of not being able to speak, the shame of feeling stupid, the shame of being treated as stupid. And it's something that like made me just deeply insecure. And to this day, I feel it. And I, to this day, I'm very, very insecure in so, so many ways. And I feel like that is such a traumatic event that I went through and that did such a number on me. And it was such a limited thing. It was just, you know, in one language that I went through, I still had an outlet in Korean and it was temporary. I knew that I was going to be able to, you know, understand and learn English pretty soon. Like, you know, it took me a couple of years. Whereas for people like Eugene, they're going through this, this, their entire lives and they have no hope of possibly, you know, coming out of that. So the pain of that and the frustration of that, I really wanted to explore that. Yeah. Um, yeah. So you, you say to me, I think I remember you saying to me that you, your, your parents are, are still with us. They're living, yeah, yeah. living nearby and that you not can, nearby in Florida, but oh, I thought, yeah, they, yeah. when did they move? They to? moved to okay. like during COVID. Yeah. 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 yeah, during yeah. COVID. Anyway, you said that you, you actually can, you can hear, you understand what they're saying, but you, yeah. you can't speak it anymore. Yeah. No, I can't. I mean, I can kind of speak it if I'm with them for a while, but um, yeah, but it's really, really hard. It's um, but yeah, I was telling you, Oh, good memory. Yeah. Um, yeah, I was just saying, like, for example, when we went to see Past Lives, a, a great movie, a great, a great movie, movie we've been really, really yeah. talking so much about. Yeah. We both love this movie so much. Yeah. Anyway, but like when we're watching movies like that or whatever, I don't need the subtitles. I can understand pretty much everything that, you know, the characters are saying. But um, when I'm actually speaking, it's really, really hard. And so I actually feel kind of the same way in Korean. Like I now feel like a babo or a stupid person. Ba like babo, 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 babo. Yeah. yeah. And it is, it's, it's embarrassing, you know, cause you're like, I really should be able, this is my first language. I should be able to speak this fluently, but because I don't speak it, you know, I very rarely speak it. It's, it's comes hard to me unless I'm like with, um, my parents for a long, long period of time and I'm talking to them which I normally speak back to them in English. So that doesn't really help either. <laughs> and yet your life is, is still defined by, by the Korean identity. Oh, you know, completely. Perma permanently. Yeah. Yeah. No, permanently. Yeah. Just because it's, it's part of me. It's part of my identity. And it's, I think it's such a formative time, you know, when yeah. you're in middle school, yeah. it's such a formative experience that I will never let go of, you know? Yeah. And yet you are this incredibly successful writer in English. You have this vast uh, network of writers whom you know, uh, many, many, many writers uh, out there in the world. What does that network do for you as as a writer? Um, yeah, I yeah, no, I'm so well, first of all, it lets me have amazing <laughs> uh, conversation partners like you. Um, which is great. And, um, and I actually have um, a couple of different writing groups that I work with. And so one is local here. And in fact, um, one was actually kind of like, you know, between, oh, <laughs> it's okay. Um, between um, Writer Center, which is where I started taking classes and here where I met, where, where we did a lot of workshops in the cafe downstairs. I, ha I just have so many fun memories and feelings of that. And we still meet monthly. And, um, and then I have another Zoom um, writing group, which is all sort of published authors. And, you know, we read each other's books um, and give each other feedback, which is so great because, um, you know, it's really nice to have sort of fresh eyes other than just your agent or editor. And for people who, you know, aren't with an an agent or editor, you know, just having fresh eyes that reads an entire work from beginning to end and can sort of give you honest feedback, I think is just so incredible. And plus, like we were talking about, you know, are we introverts, extroverts? Oh, I, I, that was my next yeah. question. So uh, where, where do you define yourself on the introvert, extrovert So I've, spectrum? I would have always said that I am extremely extroverted. Like I, I would have said so, as, as much. Right, right. 
But here's the thing. As I get older, I don't know if you feel this way. As I get older, I feel like I need more and more time to just recover. Like I still love being with people and I love like parties and, you know, talking to people and book clubs and all that kind of stuff. I love that. But I now need to like go home and just kind of collapse and just have like a lot of time just in bed, like doing the New York Times spelling bee, you know, or the crossword puzzle. Um, like or going, now connections. Or it's like going from Bill to Hillary is basically what, what you're talking about. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Right? Um, right. Yeah. I just want to open up the to, to questions. If anyone wants to, to come forward to the microphone, please do. Please do come to the microphone. Um, and uh, we will carry on. Um, while folks are, oh, I, will, I would for this gentleman. Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, there's a uh, podcast where they got uh, all of these uh, kids together with their parents and what they all have in common is that um, they were injured by vaccine when they were younger. Mm. And the show is uh, uh, by uh, Del Bigtree on the high wire. So it's definitely worth for you to look it up. Okay. And um, I wonder if your book deals with that, given that um, all these kids were, um, they had these very fancy devices. Some were more primitive devices where they just pointed to letters, mm -hmm. but others they actually uh, type in and actually very fluent um, yeah. whole sentences. Very yeah. smart kids. Yeah. Um, so I teach a group of um, non speaking, um, mostly autistics, um, and they communicate through these letter boards and also um, by using iPads and communication devices and sometimes, and none of them like type, like, you know, like, like I do, like using all 10, eight fingers, whatever, whatever I use. And, um, but they use, you know, they just do letter by letter. Um, but a lot of them do um, use a device where they type and it's slow, but then at the end of what they want to say, they press like done and it can and it speaks, you know, out loud. And um, so that is something that definitely happens. There was um, a great uh, a conference called Motor Morphosis that I went to about a two months ago, I would say. And it was a conference for non-speakers. And there were, I think, 88 non-speakers there. And I would say like a good 20 of them were using these iPad devices. So a lot of the conversations that I was having with them were done through these iPads. And it was interesting what voices they choose. Mm -hmm. So one of my beta readers for Happiness Falls is a person who uses one of these devices and he and he whenever he's doing something it actually comes out as a British voice because it, and it's the suave like and he says it's because I consider myself a James Bond and that's how I see myself so it's really really cool yeah thank you Do the parents ever talk about connection to vaccines is the question. And they don't. I haven't heard that mentioned. I do think that there are people um, that have talked about that with respect to autism, but that's not something that I am, you know, have looked into or anything like that with respect to my writing. And yeah, so and it's not a part of either of my books. Yeah. Question for you too, Nat. Um how is it different writing a first book versus a second book? Ooh, such a good question. So with my second book, I feel like it was so much harder. I feel like, and I, I talked about this with like so many people in this, you know, with Susan, with you. And um, because with the first book, there are no expectations. In fact, I have this sign up um behind my screen on my writing closet that says this is not a novel it's in big letters and and i had that up the entire time because i wanted to remind myself this is not necessarily a novel like this is just something that i'm experimenting with because i had heard from so many people 
the first novel you try to write, you write it and then you put it away in the drawer and then you like go on with your real attempt because that's that's your practice. And so that's what I sort of thought. And I thought that's okay. And that's how I allowed myself the freedom to have, for example, seven POV characters, which is what I had for Miracle Creek. Insane. So, insane. Right, right. And um, it, which seems stupid, but you know, like. No, not I, stupid, insane. insane. No, it's, it's, but, it's different. but yeah, yeah, but I mean, also like, but I, I was like, you know what, the more the better, because I'm getting practice in, you know, like different voices, which is what I really wanted to accomplish. And I also um, like felt okay about the fact that I was like writing this mystery with without having any idea of what happened and who set the fire and, you know, who was actually at fault and what was going to be the ending and all of that sort of stuff. And then when I was writing this book, my husband, Jim, he um, came in one day and I had the same sign up and he was like, um, you still have that sign up. <laughs> and he was like, I hate to tell you this, but it is, it is a novel. It has to be a novel. Contractually, it's a novel. Right, exactly. Yeah, yeah. He was like, he's a lawyer. He's like, <laughs> it, it, you have a contract that says that it's a novel and you have an editor who gave you a deadline who's waiting for it. And I was like, Ugh. so I actually wrote, um, I put in, in um, like red pen in writing, in handwriting, I put, this is not a missing person novel. <laughs> Um, because I wanted to also remind myself that even though, yes, it, it, it had to be a novel, um, I wanted to remind myself that from the perspective of the character that I was writing from, from Mia's perspective, it, it's not a novel. It's her story. It's her real life that she's going through. So she doesn't care about like story resolution or whether the twists are satisfying enough or, you know, any of that stuff. What she cares about is what's happening with my brother. Is he going to be okay? What happened to my dad? Can we possibly find out without jeopardizing my brother's safety and all of these things? And that's what I had to keep in mind first and foremost, much more so than like, you know, what is the story arc of the, you know, and is this going to have a satisfying resolution? Right. It's funny. There are, there are different characters, including Detective Janice, yes. who is two-faced, in case you missed that, uh, that mythological reference, mythological which some illusion. people <laughs> in my life have, but we won't say who they are. Um, but it, it, it does feel like a chamber piece, too. I mean, it's very much a, a novel about this, this family. And one of the things is, this is not a spoiler because it happens early on. She sees Eugene comes back without his dad yeah. and has blood on him yeah. and his sister kind of gets yeah. rid of any, any evidence without even yes. knowing what's happened. No. She's like, yeah, we got, we got to make, yeah. we got to take care because of this. Because she immediately thinks about like, Oh my God, what if somebody else saw that they would like totally misunderstand. Yeah. Yeah. We have no idea what's really happened, but whatever. Like I need to make sure that people, it's just automatic because in this community, one of the things that, the these families are always thinking about is what is the danger like what i mean and could the police be called could cps be called what do we do if they are called that is such an ever present thing that happens that you know they're just it's almost automatic it's just it's just going to happen yeah oh question Hi, uh, <laughs> thank you for um, writing about Korean people and Korean experiences. Yeah. It's really awesome. Um, and for both of you for being here. I was just curious, you mentioned you started writing kind of in your late 40s. What um, what inspired you after working as an attorney? Did you always think that you would become a writer? No, I never thought I would be a writer. Um, in fact, I went to a high school. Thank you so much for that question. Um, I went to a high school um, where actually my youngest is now in Arlacanas Academy. Academy. Yeah. I know. Mm -hmm. um, and I went there for theater and for music. And they actually have an amazing creative writing department. I never for one second thought about taking a class because I thought writers were kind of strange people. Like I was like, I didn't understand why you would want to write. You weren't wrong. You weren't wrong. Right. Yeah. No, that's true. Um, but I loved 
reading. I was an avid reader, but I didn't understand why people would want to write like and hold yourself up. And it just seemed crazy to me. And so I never wanted to do it. And then what happened was that um, we had three kids, all three boys who are all great now. But um, when they were little, all had medical issues, all different kinds. And so they sort of, I, I just became one of these moms that like what I was doing, I was a stay-at-home mom. And what I was doing all the time was like dealing with insurance companies, like figuring out different medical diagnoses and looking them up. And it was just so hard. And one day I just started writing just to cope with it, just to sort of, just for catharsis. And then I found it and I thought, you know, I really want to, you know, try to publish these pieces. And my husband said, you know, the problem with that is that these are not just your stories. These are our family's stories. These are the children's stories. And they are too young to really meaningfully consent to their stories being told in this way. And there's medical privacy issues and all that kind of stuff. So he said, why not try fiction? And I was like, fiction? I don't, I don't know how to write fiction. And so I started taking classes at the Writer Center. And I started with taking these essays and taking the characters that were me and making them into sort of alternate universe versions of me. And, and then the first time that I wrote a short story that was not really based on an essay, but just like its own story, I just remember thinking like, for all my life, I've been going from career to career, job to job, looking for something that fulfills me on like a day-to-day -day basis. And also like, you know, on a macro level satisfies me. And this is it. This is what I've been looking for. So I finally found it. So Jim gets a cut out of your royalties. Yeah. I well, yeah. I mean, I think he does anyway. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that, the whole marriage yeah, thing. Absolutely. I was, I was going to ask you, this is our last question. We're about to wrap up, I guess, unless, yeah, unless, unless if people, anybody else yeah. wants to come up, please do. Oh, come on up while, while, while you're coming Mark. up, um, while you're coming up, having success this late, we're both of people yes. of a certain no, age. No, we are. We are. Um, it's okay. Having this this late in life, what does it make it more meaningful? Does it make it sweeter at this point, or is it just the um, happiness quotient? Yeah, the, the happiness yeah. quotient, the baseline. Um, I think I'm not sure if it makes it more sweet. I think it makes it. It gives me more perspective, and it does make me feel like a little bit of almost fatalistic. Like, you know what? Even though. I may not have enjoyed any of the other, you know, like jobs that I've had or whatever. I feel like those have all contributed to where I am now. An because appre apprenticeship of right. Yeah, yeah. Because well, I can't I can't imagine having written this without some of the experiences that I went through, some of which were very painful and which at the time I wouldn't have wanted to go through. And so it does like make me feel like, you know what, there's a certain logic in all of this and the way that my life has worked out. You know what I mean? Yeah. It, yeah. Hi, Mark. Hey, Angie. Hi. Um, first of all, congratulations. Great Thank you. <laughs> um, so two questions. Do you want to speak a little oh, more no, into sure. the mic because yeah, it's yeah, been sure. recorded? Sorry. Yeah, you can. Yeah, you're tall. Yeah, tall guy. yeah you're tall. Well, you're tall. It's okay. Right. No, it's okay. Anyway. Um, you talked about the mystery being a hook, which I think you yeah. said in the first one, too. And, I, yeah. and, and not knowing how the mystery came out, but I'm curious how... It, there's a lot in this, right? There's a lot of philosophy. There's some um, Noam Chomsky's there, in it. There's <laughs> different Chomsky. kinds of philosophy. There's talk about music, which I know is from your life. There's the interpersonal relationships there, and 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 the story. And how do you? I mean, what part of those ideas do you come to start with? You said you don't know how that ends up. Like, do you say I want to explore this particular thing? And how do you make it? fit together and not either seem like, hey, I'm really just, I just really want to talk about happiness theory yeah. or it, yes. So yeah. that's question. Oh, that is such a, that is such a good question. And I feel like that's, that has been the quandary of like most of my writing days is like, I have this little bit that I know somehow fits in that I know, like I can feel it 
resonates in some weird way with what the family is going through, but I can't quite articulate it. And it's making that fit and smoothing the edges so that it does feel like it fits and so that it does feel like it's part of a whole and that the transitions are smooth and logical um, and that they make sense within the context of Mia and how her brain works and how she makes connections. I feel like that is like 80% of my writing day is like seriously taking this little bit and being like, how do I fit that in? How does this relate? I know it does relate. I just don't know how to articulate that. So that is such an interesting question, but unfortunately, I'm not sure that I have a great answer because I feel like the mysteries, like I talked about it as a hook and as a Trojan horse, but it's also like a container. And I feel like it's a container that is that I'm shaping to hold all of these ideas. And it sounds like you start with the family, like this. I started like, definitely with, the, with, with a, a family. I definitely started with a family. I definitely started with a bunch of these short stories about the family and the vignettes and, you know, um, the twins running around and doing Vulcan mind melts with each other. And, you know, one of them going on this Vulcan like opera, you know, like all of the, the Klingon opera, rather all of these things. And I have all of, so I had a bunch of these short stories and it was just a question of how do these all come together? And I felt like so much of the first pre 2020 writing of this novel was getting these little nuggets. And then after 2020, when I started really writing the novel and drafting it is figuring out how they fit. It was almost like I had all these little Lego pieces that I had made before then. And then once I started drafting, I was like trying to figure out like, how did these fit to make this structure? you know, or this final piece. Does that make sense? Like that Definitely. kind of an analogy. Yeah. 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 So my, my last much smaller question is autism. So I understand like all the other pieces kind of like autism sort of fits as an analog to your own story. But now it sounds like you're very interested, like you're actually teaching autistic kids. Yeah. Very involved. Like how did that come about? Or yeah. Did, yeah. So that came about because I do think that I always had you know, this experience that I had as an immigrant with the non-speaking. And so when I um, had, you know, some experience, a lot of um, friends from my kids and the experiences they, that they went through. So one of my kids was deaf in one ear and had apraxia and he had ulcer, ulcerative colitis. So we did this HBOT therapy that was in Miracle Creek. So we, I just, and we did a lot of speech therapy because of the apraxia and the deafness. And so because of that, I just came in contact with a lot of these families. And so I just, I just, my life just became very integrated in with the, theirs and it just kind of came together. And then when I saw about the therapies that was unlocking what was hidden inside of them all that time, it just made it so that I couldn't let it go. Like I was just like, oh my God, I have to talk about this. Yeah. So thank you. Thank you. We are out of time. Please join me in thanking Angie Kim. Thank you so much to Politics and Prose and to Susan Yay. for hosting us. And I know a lot of you probably already, and I'm so happy to sign your own copies. But if you want to support Politics and Prose by um, buying one of Lou's books and he's happy to sign, that would be great. Or other authors' books. That would be great. Thank you so much.